We're continuing our studies in the book of Mark, and we're still in Mark chapter 13. And last week, we came to verse 12, and we saw in verse 12 a very sad, a very sad situation. As we read, brother shall betray brother to death, and father son, and children shall rise up against their parents. You know, in, this, in that message last week, we saw and we looked at betrayal and how hard betrayal can be, especially when you're betrayed by people who love you or who, who you love or by your family. And that was a difficult thing that we saw. And in this passage, in this, this section, we saw that the Lord was, was explaining to the disciples that difficult days would lie ahead. You know, there would be problems, there would be difficulties. You know, it's good to be in the house of God this morning. And it's good to worship the Lord together. But we know that, as Jesus said, there will be difficult times. There will be problems, there will be trials. These things will come. And they would certainly come for his disciples. And we saw that there was a price of betrayal. The cost of betrayal and overcoming betrayal. And in each situation, we saw how people reacted differently to the betrayal. We saw Jesus betrayed by Judas. But how the Lord overcame that when he rose from the dead. You know, we saw Joseph betrayed by his own brother, sold into slavery, into Egypt. Yet through that, he never took his eyes off the Lord. You know, sometimes when things are done to us, when sometimes we are betrayed, we're let down by other people. Sometimes we, we, can, we can look on that, we can dwell upon these things, and these things can very slowly just consume our whole lives. We can be consumed by what has been done to us, by the wrongs that have happened to us. I know Joseph had a long time to think on those wrongs, put in prison, spent time in prison, but he never dwelt upon his situation. He kept his eyes upon the Lord. And when we face difficult times, when we face problems and trials, we too must keep our eyes upon the Lord. Because when we look at the circumstances, when we look at the situations, it will disappoint us, it will frustrate us. We must keep our eyes on the Lord. And Joseph did keep his eyes upon the Lord. And we saw that God had a plan for Joseph's life. And Joseph would take him from the prison, and would take him and he would, eventually his brothers would come and he would forgive them. And we see that God's hand was in Joseph and he overcame his situation. But we're still looking in verse 12 this morning, we see a very sad picture. A very sad picture where in a family situation, where brother would be against brother, father against the son, the children would rise up against their parents and cause them to be put to death. And we'll see the title this morning is rise up, rise up and we'll see the rise, we're going to just take the word rise, we'll take an acrostic on it, we'll see the rise of evil, but what combats that is the rise of, of what God can do and we'll see the rebellion, but against the rebellion we'll see to rejoice, we'll see idolatry and against that innocent Satan and against that our saviour and we'll see evil and we'll see eternal. You know the family is a big thing with God. Family is a big thing with God. God made Adam and he saw that it was not good for him to be alone. So he made him a helpmeet. And then from Adam and Eve, he said, be fruitful and multiply. Start a family. And he did start a family. And the family is a big thing with God. You know, God gives us instructions over in Ephesians chapter 6. A beautiful picture of what a family should be. In Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 1. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honour thy father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with thee, that thou mayest live long on the earth. And ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Here's a beautiful picture of what God wants for, for, for families. For children to obey their parents, and for parents to love their children, to bring them up in the things of God and the ways of God. A beautiful picture of what God wants. But we see, we see that in this, pic, in this verse in Mark chapter 12, that that would not be the situation. We see that children would rise up against their parents and cause them to be put to death. Fathers would rise up against their sons and their daughters and also cause them to be put to death. And you know, we see that God loves the idea of, of the family. Because he's our father and we're his children. We're the children of God. We are the sons of God this morning. 
And this is the Father's house that we've come into. And we come as sons of God. We come as sons of God to gather in the family of God. And that is a tremendous blessing. And we should feel the love as we gather this morning. Because this is our family. This is our family this morning as we, as we gather and worship. We've come into our Father's house to worship our Father together. And that's a beautiful thing. But you know, the devil, the devil wants to destroy the family. The devil wants to break up the family. He wants to see children rising up against their parents. He wants to see enmity and problems and difficulties. And we'll see that as we look at these points. And in the first of these points, they are for rebellion. You know, we're living in a day where, where rebellion is, where there's every opportunity for people to rebel, to rebel against authority, to rebel against different, any, any, any level of authority. There's so many opportunities now. You know, children have so many rights, and, and, and rightly so. Children should be protected. Children should know their rights, because it's sad to say that we live in a day where children are, are neglected, where children are abused. So it's right that, that children have the opportunity and have rights and are, are protected. But we see with that, there's so much information. There's so many rights. And you'll hear at times children say, you can't tell me this. I know my rights. I know this and I know that. And as I say, well, in many instances, these are good things. In some situations, we see this rise against authority. I won't be told. You can't tell me this. You can't tell me, you don't have the authority over me. I'm allowed to do what I want. And, and we see this rebellion in every walk of life. People have their rights. They know their rights. And they won't be told they can't. And when people say, well, this isn't allowed, I'll challenge that. I'll challenge that. I'll, I'll go to court. I'll, I'll make sure. And I'll challenge this because I, I want to do this. I'm going to do this. Even although the law is there and says, well, that can't be done. I'll challenge it. People don't want to be told today they can't or they're not allowed. So they'll fight against this. I know we live in a day where people grow up with entitlement. They grow up feeling they're entitled to do whatever they want. You're supposed to be happy. Just be happy. But this doesn't make me happy. Well, I'll do something about that. And we see this, 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 this feeling that people grow up with this entitlement that they should be allowed to do whatever they want. They're told, live your life the way you want to live your life. Don't be constrained by rules. Don't be constrained by this or by that. So they live their life and they become offended if somebody says, this isn't right. Or you can't do that. And they say, well, I won't have that. I've lived my whole life being told I'm allowed to do what I want, when I want. And we see the problems that, that, that come from, from living your life like that. Living this life of entitlement. You know, in a day gone by, people worked hard. People realised there were certain things they had to do, certain things that they were required to do. Now people just want, this should be given to me. I should be allowed this. I will have this. And it doesn't matter how many people are put out that I might get what I want, but I'll get what I want. And we see this, this whole rise of rebellion. And you know, we see in the day we live in, the things of God, the word of God, People don't want to hear that. Why? Because God's word says, this is sin. This is wrong. God's word says, live this life and I will bless you. I live this life and you'll be blessed. And people say, I don't want to live this way. I don't want to live constrained by God's laws, constrained by God's rules. I want to live my own life. I want to live a life that pleases me. So let's get rid of the word of God. Let's get, get rid of God's laws. God's laws are old-fashioned. God's word is out of date. We're living our own life in our own ways and we'll be happy. And you know, that's nothing new. You know, we look to the children of Israel, God's people, God's people, God's chosen people. You know, we look, they were in bondage in Egypt for years and years in bondage and they cried out to God and God sent them deliverer Moses. And God, through Moses, would deliver them from Egypt, would take them out of our bondage We'd take them through the Red Sea. We'd feed them in the wilderness. Yet as soon as the first opportunity came, they complained. They complained against God's laws. They complained against God. They complained against Moses. And we see all of that today. People don't want what God has for them. People want to live their own life. 
to do their own thing. Don't tell me that God's word says this is sin. Don't tell me that God's word says I can't do that. I'm going to do it. And I don't care. I don't care about the word of God. I don't care about the things of God. And we see that rebellion. And we see that in the rise of atheism. There is no God. So there's no God, so we don't have to live by his rules or by his ways. We see it in the rise of evolution. God's word isn't correct because it, God didn't create the world. God didn't make Adam and Eve. It's all through evolution. And all signs of rebellion against the creator, all signs of rebellion against the God who made us, we don't want that. We want to live our own life and we want to do our own thing. But you know, the opposite of rebellion is to rejoice, is the rejoicing. You know, children are a blessing from the Lord. If you turn to Psalm 127. You know, while we saw that children would, would, would rise up in rebellion, you know, we see that what children, and the, what God's word says that children should be a blessing from the Lord. In Psalm 127, and verse 3. Lord, children are heritage from the Lord, and the fruit of the womb is his reward. As arrows in the hand of a mighty man, so are children of the youth. Happy is the man that hath his quiver full of them. They shall not be ashamed, but they shall speak with the enemies at the gate. Children are a blessing from the Lord. And if you were up through the night with your child, you might think, Lord, stay your hand. I've had enough of this blessing. You know, sometimes when we perhaps are running you ragged, you just think, wow, what a blessing these children really are. But this morning we know that children are a blessing. A tremendous blessing. It's, it's, a, it's a tremendous blessing when you see new life coming into the world. You know, the whole, how a child grows in the womb, the, 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 the wonder of all of that, how it grows together, how everything knits together, how a child is born and how a child brings joy. How as a child comes into the world, when you hear somebody is pregnant and when you hear that child's been born, you're like, oh, that's lovely. And you want to hear what weight they wear. Today, you don't want to know, nobody wants to know what weight you are. But when you're born, you're like, what weight were they? What weight were they? And it's just on what, what's the name going to be? And there's an excitement. And there's a tremendous blessing when, when new life comes into the world. And you know, we see that in the word of God. Time and time again, there was a great blessing when children were born. There were certain people in the word of God who were barren. But we think of Hannah, the rejoicing when she gave birth to Samuel. For Abraham and Sarah, how they had waited such a long time for God's promise for them. And then this child was born. The answer to prayer for Elizabeth in the New Testament also, the tremendous joy of a new life coming into the world. If you turn to Luke chapter 2, we see the birth of the Lord Jesus. And again, tremendous joy, tremendous rejoicing would follow his arrival. And in Luke chapter 2 and verse 7. And she that is Mary brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them and the glory of the Lord shone round about them and they were so afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Saviour, which is Christ the Lord. What rejoicing when Jesus came into the world. Joy in heaven and joy upon earth. And we rejoice this day that our Saviour came and was born and we go to the cross for our sins. And you know, whether you have children or not, you're somebody's child. And somebody rejoiced when you were born. And you have brought blessing to your family. You've brought blessing to your parents. And you know, that's what we have. And that's the, 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 the rejoicing that children should bring. And that's the beautiful thing that as a family come together to worship the Lord. And as we've said already this morning, we rejoice to see all of the young lives that are here in Zion Baptist Church this morning. It's so good to see all the children in the Sunday school and in the Bible class. And our prayer for them this morning is that as they hear these stories, to them, they are just stories. But these stories would, over time, become more than just a story, but would become a reality. 
would become a reality in your life as they hear of these things that Jesus did and the love that God has for his people, that they would realize in time that Jesus died on the cross. Not just a story that Jesus had died on the cross, but he died for sinners and that they were the sinners that he died for. And these stories over time would become a reality in their life, would have an impact upon them and would change their life. And the same for the children in the Bible class this morning. As they hear of the things of God, as they hear of the ways of God, that they would seek to follow God's ways and follow what God has for their life, to know God's plan for their life and to walk in it, to obey it and to live in it. I know that is, that, is, that is what we pray for for them all this morning. And perhaps if you're unconverted this morning, our prayer is that you would come to know the Lord as your saviour. That this very day, you would become part of the family of God. That you would know God as your father, Jesus as your saviour. And just as when a child is born, there's tremendous, there's tremendous joy. The word of God tells us there's rejoicing in heaven over one sinner that repenteth. And we pray for that rejoicing in the house of God this day, that somebody would come to know the Lord as their saviour. They would be born again and they would come to know the, the, the wonder of the love of God and what it is to be part of the family of God. But you know, the thing that we see, children will grow up. Children will grow up and at times you, have a, you want the best for your children. You want the best for them to, to, to develop and to grow and to do to, to forge their own path, but at times things will happen in the life that, that perhaps disappoint, that perhaps horrify at times the things. That, there will be people this morning whose children have committed terrible crimes, done, to, done terrible, terrible things, and they will think of that child that they, they nursed, they brought up, and this morning perhaps they're a murderer, perhaps they've done terrible crimes. And you know, we see in this second point of idolatry. You know, God's people had been blessed so much. God had given them so much. He had chosen them out of all the nations. His hand was upon them. He had given them prophets. He had given them his word, his will. But often, so often, they would go off and do their own thing. They would go off to disobedience. They would go off, as I said this morning, we don't want these laws constraining us. We don't want to be told that the way we live our life is sinful to God. So we're not having that. We're going to do our own thing. And the same was true in the word of God. So often God's people, despite all the good that God had done for them, still wanted to do their own thing. You know, as I said, the children of Israel had been brought out of bondage, had been delivered from the, from the Egyptians, been brought through the Red Sea. God had fed them manna in the wilderness. But you know, at the first opportunity, when things seemed to be difficult, when Moses was up the mountain, they said, let's make us a God to worship. Let's break off all the gold. Let's make a golden calf. And we'll worship this God. And they made an idol. They had the true and the living God. Yet they wanted to worship the idols of the, of the people they had left behind. And so often we see God's people go, go off for idolatry. If you turn with me to 2 Chronicles chapter 27. in the book of Chronicles we see time and time, ad time, and time again different kings would come and we'd, we'll read of what, what they had done and how they served God and that was one in 2 Corinthians, Second Chronicles sorry, chapter 27 and verse 1 <clears throat> and Jotham was 20 and 5 years old when he began to reign and he reigned 16 years in Jerusalem his mother's name was Josiah, the daughter of Zadok, and he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, according to all that his father Josiah did. Here we see a man becoming the king, and he did that which was right in the sight of God. A beautiful thing. By verse 9 of the chapter, and Jotham slept with his fathers, and they buried him in the city of David, and Ahaziah, his son, reigned in his stead. And in, verse, in chapter 20, Isaiah, Isaiah, was 20 years old when he began to reign. And he reigned 16 years in Jerusalem. But he did not that which was right in the sight of the Lord. He did like, like David his father, for he walked in the ways of the kings of Israel and made molten images for Balaam. Moreover, he burnt incense in the valley of the sons of Hinnom and burnt his children in the fire. Here was a young man whose father 
had followed in the ways of God, who had sought to do that which was right in the sight of God. Yet at 20 years of age, he becomes the king and he rebels against all that his father had done. And he starts to worship idols. He starts to, to worship other gods. Other gods, the gods of, of the nations round about. What a sad picture. What a heartbreak for a family to see your children go away from the things of God. Go after the things of the world and worship the idols of the world. And the same is true over in, in chapter 29. In verse 1, Hezekiah began to reign when he was five and twenty years old. And he reigned nine and twenty years in Jerusalem. And his mother's name was Abijah, the daughter of Zechariah. And he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, according to all that David his father had done. And in this chapter, it will list all the things that Hezekiah did. How he broke down the groves, how he broke down all the, the, the images, all the idols to other gods. How he sought to, to raise up the people to follow after God and to do the things of God. A great king, a wonderful king. But when we get to, and I will just do chapter, to chapter 33, just before that, in, 30, in chapter 32 and verse 33, Hezekiah slept with his fathers and they buried him in the chiefest of the sepulchres of the sons of David. And all of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem did honour him at his death. And Manasseh, his son, reigned in his stead. Here's this young man, in chapter 33 of 2 Chronicles. And Manasseh was 12 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 50 and 5 years in Jerusalem. But he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord, like unto the abominations of the heathen, whom the Lord had cast out before the children of Israel. For he built again the high places which Hezekiah his father had broken down, and he reared up also altars for Balaam, and made groves and worshipped all the hosts of heaven and served them. A sad picture. This young man had seen his father change so much, get rid of all the false worship, set up the true worship of God. Yet at 12 years of age, he became king and he sought to do that which was evil in the sight of God. He raised up all these other idols and worshipped all the hosts of heaven. What a sad, sad picture. What a sad picture that we see. The wickedness. To have been brought up in the ways of God to know the, the, the true and living God, but rather to choose the idols of the world. To choose the idols, so often God's people would choose the idols of the people that, that they had defeated. Their gods could not protect them, yet they would choose their gods over the true and living God. And you know, we see that even today, perhaps we don't worship idols made of gold and made of stone. But we see a sad picture where, where perhaps people brought up in the house of God will go after the things of, the, the things of this world. We'll make an idol of a person, of a relationship, an idol of a sport, or an idol of a job, something that they love more than they love God. And instead of worshipping God who has blessed them and been with them, they choose other things and they go after other things. And these things become the big thing in their life. And just like as we see in this picture, they forget the true God. And they live their life now without God. They live their life with no thought or care for God. These other things are more important. And these other things take them far, far from God. And we see that we must guard our hearts that we never, we may sit in the house of God this morning and think we would never go after other gods. We would never have something before the Lord. Yet we must guard our hearts that we don't allow ourselves to be caught up, to take our eyes off the Lord, to take our eyes off the things of God. Or we too could find ourselves like those who have went after other gods, other things. There's people this morning who once were in the house of God. Today they're in the world, living for the things of the world. And we must guard our hearts that we don't ever take our eyes off the true and living God and find ourselves back in that world because it breaks the heart of God. As a father, his heart was broken time and time again by the children of Israel, by their disobedience. By, as they went after all these other things, that his heart was broken. We must make sure that we don't break the heart of God. You know, what, what rejoices the heart of God is the, the innocence. The innocence. You know, we see that in this world there are many evils. In this world there are many things that are wrong, many wickedness, many evil things. 
But you know, as a child of God, we should be innocent in many ways to these things. Not in a way that we don't know that they exist. We don't live in a life where we don't know, well, I didn't know that's a thing or that's a thing. Of course we know there's evil in the world. Of course we should know things that are wrong. But the difference should be we don't involve ourselves in these evils. We're innocent in many ways to the evils of this world. You know, if you turn to Romans chapter 16. Romans, Romans chapter 16 and verse 19. For your obedience has come abroad unto all men, and I am glad thereof on your behalf. But yet I would that you be wise unto that which is good and simple concerning evil. Be wise for that which is good, but simple concerning that which is evil. And you know, God says, listen, involve yourself. Take an interest in that which is good. Make your heart's desire upon the things of God upon the word of God make these the things that your interest is in and be simple concerning the things of this world don't involve yourself in too much of the things of this world now of course we live in the world and we, we see the news and we see all of these things but what God is saying don't make these things your big interest don't be so interested in all the evil all the evil things that happen don't spend your time get looking into things and getting, reading up in things and, and watching things that are evil Keep yourself from these things. Keep yourself in, in it. We live in a day where in our hands, in our pockets is a phone and all manner, of, all manner of things are available. There are good things, but there are many evil things. And, and God's word says, don't let yourself get too caught up in the things of this world, looking at things, watching things, going to places where evil exists, where evil is. Be simple concerning these things. Have a certain innocence regarding them. You know, there's a, there's a beautiful innocence in children. You know, when they're young, they're trusting. That's why we have to tell them to warn them of strangers, to warn them that not every adult's the same. You know, we ha because they have a trust. They, they don't know that people will do bad things to them. They don't know that bad things exist. They just live with a, this beautiful innocence. And you know, in a good family, with a family, there's a beautiful innocence. They can have... They can have good fun. They can, they can share things together. No one is thinking, why are, they, why are they giving me this? What do they want from me? They just, there's an innocence that they know that everybody loves one another. That everybody wants the best for each other. No one's sitting there thinking, ah, what's, what's their angle? Why are they saying this to me? Because there must, they must want something. Or something bad's going to happen. You know, in a family where there is love, there's a beautiful innocence. That everybody just loves one another. Everybody's happy for each other. Everybody wants the best for each other. And it's a beautiful thing when you see children in, in a family all getting on together and loving one another and helping one another. And that's what God wants. And that's what we should feel in the house of God this day as a family of God. There should be a beautiful innocence, a beautiful love. There's, no, there's a, a pure love that we love one another, that we care for one another. That nobody's sitting thinking, Aye, why did they give me that? Why are they saying that to me? Something, they're up to something. They want something. I'll, I'll have to keep my eye on that person because they've been giving me things and they've been saying nice things to me. Something, they're up to, I'll keep my eye on them. No, there's a, everybody just loves. We love one another. We rejoice with those that rejoice. We weep with those that weep. And in the house of God and in the family of God, this should be a place where you feel loved. This should be a place where you love one another. And there's no agendas and there's no other things at play. You just know that everybody loves the Lord. And everybody loves one another and we've come to worship the Lord. And that is the beautiful thing that we, we see. No one's sitting finding fault with other people saying, ah, I'll, they've done this, I'll note that. I'll note that for another time because I'll, I'll remember that. No, everybody just loves. And there should be forgiveness and there should be a, a oneness. And that's the beautiful innocence that you should have in a family. You know, that brings us to, the, to Satan. You know, the devil doesn't want that. The devil doesn't want this, this, this family of God. He doesn't want your family. The devil wants to destroy the family. 
The devil wants to destroy the home. He wants to make it difficult. He wants to make problems and, and he wants rebellion. He wants parents to, to rise up against their children. He wants children to rise up against their parents. He wants disharmony. He wants problems. He wants difficulties. And you know, we see that right from the very beginning of creation. God made a beautiful world. He made Adam and Eve. But right from the start, the devil came in to destroy that. To destroy that, that Adam would say, it's not me, it's this woman that you gave me. To cause the division, to cause a problem, and cause that problem right at the very start. And you know, we see with, with the children of, of Adam and Eve, Cain and Abel, two brothers, Cain would slay, would slay Abel, would murder him. And right from the start, the devil get in to destroy the family, to destroy what the family should be. And from then on, we see... The devil wants to destroy the family. And many things will destroy families. There's many things that happen that destroy families. You know, we see adultery can come in in a, in a family and the terrible impact that can have. It breaks up families. Children then live in different, have different homes to live in. Perhaps grandparents never see a child again because the family is broken up and, and the children are taken away to another family and they never see them again. And, and so much hurt and so much can happen all through, through adultery. Sad to say, but there's, there's tremendous neglect in some families. While you may have been brought up in a good family, you may have been brought up in a family where you were loved and cared for, today there's children who are neglected. You, we do see in the news children who are, who are brought up in terrible conditions, so treated so badly by people who are supposed to love them and care for them. It is terrible. It is, it is wicked. And you know, we see that tremendous disobedience in all of these things also. And all of these things we see, that's what the devil wants to cause and to bring, to bring this whole, to destroy what the family should be, destroy the whole, the whole love that should be in a family. And you know, we see that very much in, in the laws that are passed in our land today. You know, we see this whole thing that don't call, don't call that woman your mother. Don't call them their father. We don't want these terms. We can't have these terms because we're living in a day where we're gender neutral. So don't call this person mother. Just refer to them as your, that's a parent. And that's a parent because other people don't have mothers and fathers. So we can't have these kind of things. And this whole breakdown of what the family should be, this breakdown of, you know, don't call me male, don't call me female, I'm gender neutral. And, and for, these, for so many of these things we see, they're not just happy to live like that. They want to make sure that everybody has to live like that. And it creeps into, the, it creeps into homes, it creeps into to, to every walk of life. You know, different things in schools, there's no, you know, Jack and Katie's school, for instance, don't have a head boy or head girl any longer. We've got to get rid of these terms because there's some people who don't like the term boy, girl, so we'll get rid of that. You see different different things to push. Let's get rid of male and female toilets. Just make it a public toilet because people don't want to, to have these terms. And these things happen and these things change and breaks down that, that, that's, your, that that's your father and that's your mother. No, they're, they're just your parent. Don't call them these things. And it, it comes and, you know, we think that these things will never get out of hand. These things are out of hand. A way way back when this was first mentioned, people said these, this will happen. People say these things will, no, this will never happen. And now these things are happening. You know, we see even this week, the law has been changed in Scotland for smacking your children. Now, of course, discipline is important. And I'm not saying that you should smack your child, especially if they're 16. But what I'm saying is this, that discipline is important. And while it's right and proper that children shouldn't be abused and children are abused, children are violently abused at times. And, and these things, we know these things happen. We know that these things go on, but there's good parents who love their children, who discipline their children, and they now find themselves in a situation that they could be brought before courts for simply disciplining their children. And you know, that's, that's the crazy situation that we're in. Because these laws will never protect the children who have already been, who have been neglected and abused because the law's already there for that. If children are being beaten, if children are being physically abused, the law's already there to stop that. The problem will now come upon those parents who love their children, who discipline them in love, not because they want to punish them, but because they want, to, they want them to grow up and, and, and be, good, be good children and share and, and do other things. 
No, how often have you seen a child, perhaps, in the supermarket, and you think, what that kid needs is a good smack? And that's the case. I'm not saying that children should be getting the belt out to them and, and beat them with a stick, but at times the discipline, discipline is, is required. And we see in Proverbs, in Proverbs chapter 13, you know, for many of us, we were disciplined as children, and we don't grow up saying, oh, because of the things that happened to me, this is how I've turned out. Because everything was done in love. We were disciplined in love. And, and at the end of the day, it was, for, it was for our benefit that we would know what was right, what was wrong. And we see the, the craziness that, that, that comes from it in, in Proverbs chapter 13 and verse 24. He that spareth his rod hateth his son, but he that loveth him chasteneth him at bedtimes, chaseth him often. And that's the thing. We don't discipline our children because we, we, we hate them. The very fact, if we don't discipline them, if you let a child grow up to do whatever they want, whenever they want, they will. They'll do what they want, when they want, but it will not be to their benefit. It will not be in the long run because there's things when you're, you're, when you're a child that you want to do. You want to run in the road. You want to touch, you want to put your hand in the fire. Why do you want to do all these things? Because you just want to. And you don't like being told not to. But you realise there was a reason why you were, why you were told no. Why you were disciplined for certain things. And these things that we do because that we love our children. I know the Lord loves, the Lord loves the children. And that's the Saviour. And we see in, in this point of the Saviour that Jesus loved the little children. Suffer the little children to come unto me. And while the devil wants to destroy the family, Jesus wants to take those who are sinners and bring them into the family of God. Jesus came and died upon a cross and took the punishment that sinners might be saved, that his people would be saved and would know that they were the sons of God, would know the love of God, would know the love of the Father. You know, Jesus wants to bring unity, not division. He wants to bring a love, a pure love. You know, the house of God should be a place for the prodigal to return. You know, a welcome for the outcast, a healing for the broken, a home for the lost. That's what God wants. And you know, we see time and time again in the scriptures that God mended families. You know, you can, we'll not look it up, but in 2 Kings chapter 4, we have the story of the widow whose sons were going to be sold as bondsmen because she couldn't afford. And Elisha came and they took the oil and, and from that oil, the oil continued and continued and continued. They filled all the vessels and that family was, was kept together. And time and time again, there are stories like that where, where God, God's prophets, God's people would, would restore the family, would bring the family together. When it looked like the family was about to be broken up, God would intervene. And we see that God wants for us this day to be the family of God. And if you're unconverted this morning, God wants for you to be part of this family, to come to know him as your saviour, to come to know the love of God. And that's what we see. But very quickly as, as time goes, then the last two points we see E is for evil. And we know from the Garden of Eden, evil has, there has been the rise of evil. There has been times in, in the world of tremendous evil, tremendous wickedness. We think of the Holocaust and we think of different things. We see things that we read in the paper and we, we can't quite get our heads around how evil man can be to its fellow man. How parents can be to their children. We see evil. We see evil in this world. And you know, I'll turn it back, but we saw it in, in Second Chronicles. And we saw with these two kings, and both of them, both of them, Ahaziah first in, in Second Chronicles chapter 28. And it says in verse 3, Moreover, he burnt incense in the valley of the sons of Hinnom and burnt his children in the fire. What wickedness. To take your own children and to put them onto these great images that were heated up and burn them alive. And a, a tremendous wickedness, tremendous evilness. And we see that the same that Manasseh did in, th in chapter 33 of Second Chronicles. And in verse 6, and he caused his children to pass through the fire in the valley of the sons of Hinnom. What a wicked thing. A wicked thing to take your own family, your own flesh and blood, and to cause them to be put to death. And you know, we see even today that children can be taken from the womb and their life can be extinguished through abortion. 
The opportunity to live, to grow, is taken away. Why? Because it doesn't suit the lifestyle. It doesn't suit, we don't want them, we don't need them. There's a problem with them, so we don't want them. Let's just do away with them. The same wickedness that happened then is happening today. You know, even today, in different parts of the world, people, children, young people are growing up in families where they've been put to death by their parents, by their brothers, because they've come to know the Lord as their saviour. Because they've come to know Christ and they live in a, in a family, perhaps of a different religion, and they're, they're not only giving them up, they're not only giving them up, but they're, they're putting them to death. And we see that for many of God's people in different parts of the world, that is the circumstances they live under. Fear of their own family giving them over. Fear of their own family putting them to death. And we see this is, this is the wickedness, this is the evil that we live in. You know, when will evil stop? When Jesus comes back. Up until that point, the evil will reign. The devil is a prince of the power of the air. But one day Jesus will return. One day he will return. And if we are still on this earth when he comes, we will, up, we will be caught up to be with him. We will rise up to be with him. And on that day there will be no more tears. There will be no more fears. There will be no more sadness. There will be no more evil. There will just be joy in the presence of God. There will be joy. There will be peace. There will be happiness. And that's all for those who are part of the family of God. And again, I would say, if you're not this morning, if you don't know the Lord as your saviour, if you don't know that God is your father, I pray that you would come to him this day. That you would see the love of God. The love that Jesus had when he went to the cross. When he died on that cross. And that you would realise this morning that you are a sinner. God has laws. God's laws are just. God's laws are right. We have all sinned. We have all come short of his glory. Every one of us here is a sinner. Every one of us has sinned. But some of us this morning know what it is to be forgiven. Not because of anything that we have done. Not because we're good people. But simply because God has loved us. You know, your children were born into your home. And you love them. And God loves us. The word of God tells us at times parents will forget their children. But he will never forget us. God's love for us will never end. And I pray this morning, if you don't know that love, that you would come to him this day. You would come and know the love of the Saviour. And you know, as I say, we live in a wicked day. We live in an evil day. But thank God this morning we've come to the house of God. And we've come to lift our voices and to raise our voices and worship to our God, to our Father, who, who Jesus died to bring us, to, bring us into adoption into the family of God. That's where we are this morning, adopted in the family of God. May we thank him, may we worship him for all that he's done. Amen.